welcome to another video in our Forecasting Principles uh, video series. I'm Stefan Kolassa. I'm a data scientist, data science expert at SAP Switzerland. I'm also affiliated with the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting at the University of Lancaster. Today, we're going to talk about forecasting in retail. And actually, that is a wonderful topic because that's what I'm earning my money with. And uh, the good thing is everybody can understand what I'm talking about when I say forecasting in retail. Why does a retailer need forecasts? Well, for many, many, many different business decisions. You need it for strategic planning, uh, where to open a store, where to close a store, um, other, um, whether to add a new product line, uh, whether to branch out in some new direction. You need it for other strategic decisions, whether to go with promotional um, sales or with an everyday low price strategy. You need it for tactical planning, like assortment planning. Um, I'm selling canoes, but which canoe am I going to put into my stores for the next canoeing season? They take up a lot of space. I can't just put in everything. Allocation planning, price optimization, promotion planning, supplier negotiations and logistics. Finally, operational planning, like store replenishment or distribution center replenishment. And Actually, the bottom part is uh, what I know most about, but and that's what's we're, what we're mostly going to talk about. As an example, here's a time series of uh, daily sales for one stock keeping unit in one store. And yes, this is ancient. This is, uh, by the time I'm recording this, almost 14, 15 years old. That doesn't matter because this is, is a timeless product that everybody knows. It's tomatoes. This is sales in kilograms per day at one particular store. And we already see a couple of things in this time series here. We see seasonality, for instance. So if we just fit a model with seasonality, with yearly seasonality, I should say, we already see that there is higher sales in summer than in winter, uh, which is not a really surprise because at this uh, place in the world, people will buy their tomatoes for a tomato salad in early and mid-summer for their barbecue parties. So uh, there is a certain cultural affinity for summer Eating, for, for eating tomatoes in summer. However, there is also other dynamics at work here. For instance, if we plot uh, this time series, not as a time series, but plot it against the day of the week, then we see an interesting pattern emerge. Now we see that we have a certain level of sales Monday through Thursday, and then higher sales on Friday, and even higher sales on Saturday, and no sales at all on Sunday, which is not a surprise because the store is closed on Sundays. That makes life easier for us. And that again is a completely standard pattern in retail because people will do their weekly shopping on Friday after work or at, on Saturday morning. And the retailer needs to keep that in mind because if you don't keep that in mind, then you'll put too, much, too many tomatoes into your store on Monday through Thursday and not enough on Friday and Saturday. And people will be unhappy on Friday and Saturday because they're not getting their tomatoes or they might be getting the tomatoes that you put in on Monday and that are soggy by now. So you need to keep that in mind. And if you do keep that in mind and fit the model with yearly and day of week seasonalities, you have multiple seasonalities that overlap each other, we get something that gets more and more sophisticated. Something else that we associate with retailers is frequent price changes, especially promotional price changes. Uh, we see promotional price changes, which is when the retailer reduces price and is uh, very vocal about that and actually tells us about that. Um, you have pop-ups in your app on your mobile phone. You have shelf tags and whatever. We're going to talk about that later on. We also have the um, less conspicuous price changes in the other direction. When people improve, increase their prices, uh, they're not going to tell you about that, but that also happens. Uh, here we have lots of price changes where the price goes down and unsurprisingly sales go up because if you have a promotion on tomatoes and people will eat more tomato salad or something else. So we need to keep that in mind and include it in our model. And if we model both yearly seasonality and day of week seasonality and price changes and also include the future price changes and fortunately we know about these because a retailer can set their own prices in contrast to other drivers. Uh, then we get a forecast that actually uh, tells us we're going to sell more during a period of reduced pr prices. Uh, however, causal factors like the prices that we just saw in retail get far more complicated, far more complicated than just looking at prices. There is a whole zoo of different causal influences, uh, most of which we can forecast, so uh, most of whose 
values we know for the future. We have promotions. And in promotions, we have lots of interesting abbreviations like TPR, temporary price reductions. You just reduce the price, as it says on the tin, very simple. You can have BOGO, buy one, get one. So you buy one package or one bottle of shampoo, you get a second bottle for free. You might also have something that is a little more complicated. Buy three units of one product at 20% off and then you get five units of something completely unrelated at 50% off because marketers at retailers are enormously inventive and uh, they're quicker at dreaming up new promotions than the poor IT people, that's me, are in including them in their IT systems and in their forecasts. And then uh, we get the complaints why we're not quick enough at forecasting all of these things. You could have conditions. You can only take advantage of this offer if you have this coupon, if you have this, uh, this pop-up in your app, or if you're a loyalty card holder if at the gold level or what have you. Conversely, you might get other rewards than a, a price reduction. If you buy this product, then you get airline miles, very common in the United States. If you buy this product, you get additional and additional 200 points on your loyalty cards. Um, you, the price doesn't change, but you get more points and you can use those points somewhere else. And people will start com combining these offers and things will get complicated indeed. And that we, the forecasters, need to figure out how do all these possibilities influence demand and we need to forecast that. You might have different tactics, and by tactics, I mean how do we communicate to the customer that we're having an offer? Are we having a shelf tag? Are we having the pop-up in our app? Uh, do we have a secondary placement in the store? Do we have something in the newspaper, in the, on TV, or whatever? And then you might also have suppression effects on regular sales. If you track regular and promotional sales separately, then when you have a promotion, you'll have lower regular sales. And sometimes the accountants at the retailers like to treat these separately and forecast these separately. You have calendar events like Christmas, which has an impact on certain products. You have a Chinese New Year, which has a different, a, an impact on certain products in certain parts of the world, not in others. Uh, it may have day of month effects or paycheck effects or even uh, bi-weekly seasonality paycheck effects, depending on how often your paychecks or even your social uh, security or uh, other uh, supplementary payments arrive. You may have holiday effects. If you have a store that's somewhere in a holiday destination, then you are going to see a huge impact of when the school holidays are uh, around that store. You may have other stuff like weather, uh, weather is always something that retailers like to think about and to include in the forecast. The problem is that if you include weather in your forecasts, you need the weather forecast because you don't know the weather in a week. You only know today's weather forecast for in a week. And of course, we know that the weather forecast is not perfect. And this noise, this error in the weather forecast directly goes through to our demand forecast and means that the demand forecast that uses the weather is a little bit more uncertain and probably going to be a little more, bit more wrong uh, than if we knew the weather with, with certainty, which we don't. There's cannibalization. If you have a promotion on one, kind, one brand of product, then uh, you're going to have lower sales on a different brand of the same kind of product. I'm not going to name names here, but everybody can think of something. Could have kind of complementarity if we have a promotion on steaks and we might expect higher sales on steak sauces. And you want to include those and account for those and forecast those. So many different things. As an example, um, and the problem then is that we don't have those in isolation. So we might be, it might be easy to separate the effects out. But typically we'll have all of these together. It's like a, a big Lego model. People will put stuff together, especially different tactics. Look, we're going to reduce prices on this product and we're going to announce it in the app and we're also going to put in a shelf tag. Two weeks later, same product. We have a different price reduction. It's a little higher or a little lower. Uh, we're not going to tell people that the last price reduction was at this point in time and uh, of this amount, but we're going to put a secondary placement into the store and we're going to have a little flyer that's being handed out in the parking lot. Uh, so they're all combined together with each other and then at some point in time in the future, we're going to have a forecast with a combination of predictors that we've never seen before. Perhaps we've seen every single separate predictor somewhere in the history, but it's always been paired or tripled or whatever, quadrupled with lots of other predictors. And now suddenly we need to forecast for a combination that we've never seen before. Uh, that makes life hard and interesting. 
We've seen this particular picture before. That was about having different uh, amounts, different average sales and during the week. Lower sales on Monday through Thursday, higher sales on Friday and Saturday. That's Central Europe, other parts of the world differ. What I'd like to draw attention now is to the fact that we don't only have higher sales or lower sales during the weekend, but we also have higher variants of sales. Sales are more spread out on Friday and Saturday because during the week people will buy their tomatoes for their own tomato salad, but on Friday and Saturday they might have a party and they might want to, to create like five bowls of tomato salad or they might have some fair or some other event where they eat lots of tomatoes at one point in time. And so somebody is buying a lot of tomatoes and somebody else, well, they're not buying tomatoes because they're going to have a party, but they are going to bring a cake. So they won't be bringing the tomatoes. So they don't, buy, they don't buy any tomatoes at all. They buy everything for three cakes. And so we have additional variability on Friday and Saturday. Why is this important? This is important because we not only need to forecast average sales, but we also need to forecast the quantiles because as a retailer, we don't want to stock up for the average demand that people face. We want to have enough safety amount so that even the person that comes in late in the day will still be able to buy what they wanted. So we need to account for this variability that at some, on some days more people buy something and on other days fewer people buy something. Because if we only stock up for the average demand, then lots of people will leave disappointed. We don't want disappointed customers because those people tend to not come back and tend to leave scattering reviews on Google. We don't want that. So we need quantile forecasts. We need to forecast the 95th or 99th quanta percent, percentile of demand to be able to set safety amounts. And for that, it is imperative to account for the fact that the variability is different during different parts of the week. And of course, the exact same thing also happens during promotions. Promotions not only increase average sales, they also increase the variability of sales. Because sometimes, well, people will buy stuff on promotion and they're just gonna buy a little more. And sometimes somebody else is going to stock up and fill up their pantry with whatever it is. So this is especially important, not so much for the tomatoes that, we look, that we've been looking at, but for stuff that is more shelf-stable, high-priced stuff. If you have a promotion on coffee or on olive oil in Switzerland, where both of these are horrendously expensive, if you have a promotion, people will stock up on that and you're going to have huge spikes that are very variable and you need to account for that in your forecast. So once you're forecasting out, we're zooming into the forecast period now and we see the actual sales as a gray line at the very bottom and then we see a couple of lines above that. One of them is the average, the expectation forecast, that's what we expect to sell and on top of that we see three different quantile forecasts for, I believe it's quantiles 90%, 80%, 90%, 95% or something like that. And the retailer has to make a strategic decision. Do I want to go with a high target service level? Do I want a service level of 95% with the, with the risk that I'm going to have stock left over at the end of the day, that especially for perishables like tomatoes, I may need to throw away. Or do I go with a lower service level with potentially more disappointed customers, but less waste and less stuff that I have to throw away? That's a decision that the retailer has to make. That's something where the forecaster can only tell them the consequences later on, but uh, it's a decision by the user of the forecast. Other things that uh, a retail forecaster has to keep in mind is short time series. Because on average, a retailer, a brick and mortar, like a grocery retailer, they're going to change about 30% rule of thumb of their assortment every single year. Well, do the math and you know that uh, less than half of your assortment have two years of history or more. And for a forecaster that wants to forecast with a year-on-year -year seasonality, uh, having two years of history is a bare minimum. So if uh, for half of your assortment you only have one year or something else, 18 months, six months, you have a problem with forecasting seasonality. You have to do some smart things about inheriting seasonality from other products. But to know which product you want to inherit seasonality from, you really need good product hierarchies. Uh, so the forecaster suddenly needs to think about product master data. Is the master data good enough so we know how to learn for one product from other products? It gets interesting. And sometimes people ask us to forecast from four days of data. And sometimes we do a good job. And those are the, the time series that we select for marketing slides. Sometimes we do a less good job. And that's something we don't talk about. 
Other things in retail forecasting are life cycles or seasonal products. Um, life cycles, um, as on the left-hand side, those are most important in fashion or consumer electronics. If you have a fashion product and you need to forecast for fashion too, um, you typically have only a few weeks or a few months where the product is actually sold. And the most important part is on the one hand at the beginning, because that's when you sell the most of your product. And on the other hand, at the end, because at some point in time, you have only a few products left or few units of that product left. And you want to push them out the door so you have room for the next assortment. So that's when you start marking stuff down. And you want to mark stuff down in a way uh, that is smart because you don't want to lose too much money on your marked down product. Ideally, you'll have it all out the door five seconds before the new assortment arrives. And uh, there is a bit of an art in here, and there is a games that the retailers play with their customers and the customers play with their retailers. And the forecaster has to deal with all that because the forecaster's sales, uh, the forecaster's data, the data that we as forecasters get, first of all, we don't have data for the products that we're forecasting at the beginning of the season. When we uh, source, when the retailer sources fashion products in Vietnam, China, whatever, they haven't seen any sales on that because that happens half a year or a year before the product hits the shelves. So we need to forecast sales before we've seen any data. So we, again, need good master data to say this product that we're trying to order today is similar to those three products that we sold in the last couple of years. So we're going to learn from them in terms of life cycle patterns in terms of promotional responsiveness, so we know how to deal with markdowns at the end of the season already, all these kinds of things. And then at some point in time, we have seen data and then we need to forecast for markdowns because for the markdowns, we again we want to set, we want to mark down this product by 30% and that product by 50% and that product by 70%, all in order to be able to push it out the door, but still make the most money out of it in expectation essentially. Or we might have a full markdown schedule. First we mark it down by 30%, then by another 20%, then by another 20%. We always hope that it's going to be selling at the highest possible price that we can still achieve. And that always, that's a question of forecasting. That's, season, that's a scenario forecasting for markdowns. And it doesn't help that often we don't have the exact stock data in a store. So when we see a product and it wasn't sold in a store, we don't know whether that means that people didn't want it or whether that means we didn't have it in the store. And sometimes the store stock information doesn't help because the product has been stolen and the system, the stock system says we still have one unit left in the store, but actually there's physically nothing left because it's been stolen. We don't see any sales. We believe, well, we had one unit left. It's in, it says so in the stock information system, but actually there was nothing there. So these zero sales may have been unsatisfied demand because the product was not there. And the forecaster has to deal with all of these. And conversely, relatedly, we have seasonal products like the tomatoes. Well, the tomatoes, they sell all year long, but there's other products like local strawberries. You can't buy them in Central Europe all year long because it's, there's a growing season. And in winter, your strawberries come from far away. And so we have a certain growing period and selling period for the local strawberries and for rhubarb and asparagus and similar things. And you have to capture that one too. And sometimes you need to forecast when the selling season is going to start or think about garden furniture. Not so much a growing period, but a question of when, when's the first nice weather, the first weekend with nice weather, especially here in the UK where I am at the moment. Uh, first nice weekend in the, in the year is the first barbecue weekend. Uh, people will bar buy their barbecue meats, but all the, also all the lawn furniture and the grills to put outside. And if you as a home improvement or do-it-yourself retailer, if you don't have your garden furniture on the, on the shop floor at that, on exactly that weekend, then you're out of luck because people will buy their garden furniture elsewhere and it won't help you if you push your garden furniture out on the shop floor two weeks later because everybody else, everybody has already gotten their garden furniture. So really to capture the beginning of the selling season. And again, weather is very important here. Forecasting in retail has different dimensions. I mean, forecasting always has different dimensions, but in retail, uh, it's hugely important. There's dimensions along time. There's dimensions along uh, the product uh, hierarchy, and there's this, I like to call it the supply chain or location dimension. In time, some forecasts you need on a daily granularity, some you need on an hourly granularity. If you have a, like a, 
a convenience food uh, counter in your store, you're making your own uh, grilled chickens, you can't uh, just forecast for the whole day. You have to forecast per hour or per two hour bucket because nobody wants to buy the grilled chicken in the evening that was grilled in the morning and kept warm all day long. So you really need to forecast for demand across the entire day in hourly or two hourly buckets. And other forecasts you only need on a weekly level. If you're forecasting for distribution center replenishment, don't need a forecast on an hourly level because you only get a truck from the supplier once every week. So you only need to know how much demand am I going to face in the entire week afterwards until the next truck arrives. So there's a the time granularity. And similarly in the product dimension, you need forecasts on the stock keeping unit level for replenishment because you, only, you need to forecast to replenish on the SKU level. But when it comes to promotion, uh, you don't promote a single stock keeping unit, promote an entire brand or part of a brand. And when you plan a promotion and you need to think about budgets and talking to the supplier, nobody cares whether, whether you're selling more or less of a particular um, box of particular pasta with Barilla. People care about how much you're going to sell on the entire promotion across all products. So you need a forecast on the aggregate, not per SKU, but per brand. And similarly, you don't care about whether you're promotionally selling in the store, you care about how much you're going to sell across your entire chain. So you need to forecast not on the location, on the store level, but on the entire chain level. And then at some point in time, you decide to run the promotion and then the supply chain planner, they have to think about per SKU, per location forecast. So you have an interplay between forecasts at different vintages in different granularities and different dimensions here. It's hugely interesting. Lots of examples here that I'm not going to inflict on you. Mass data. Uh, I used to say that we have been doing uh, big data before the term became popular. Uh, of course, I know that tens of thousands of stock keeping units in thousands of stores, that's not really big data as such nowadays, but it used to be very big and it's still far more than humans can understand and, and interpret because 10,000 products or 20,000 products in 1,000 stores, that is completely run of the mill. That is nothing strange about it for, for, for a retailer. And that's already 20 million time series that you may need to forecast every single day. Nobody can look at 20 million forecasts every single day, can't do that. So you have to do some kind of automatic forecasting and you need to be able to have an, you need to have an automatic alerting system that tells you something is wrong in this situation, you may want to look at this forecast and in that one and on that one. And every demand planner may want to look at five such situations per day or 10, certainly not a thousand. And you need to figure out a good way of picking out those forecasts where your system is going to have a hard time. And relatedly, you really need to reduce these strange situations as much as possible. So even if you don't know what you're doing, or what the, if the system has a hard time and needs to forecast something reasonable and not go haywire and just do something, well, I don't know what's gonna happen here. I'm just gonna give you whatever forecast. This is robustness. I've been talking about that in other uh, presentations here. Robustness in this case means falling back to a reasonable forecast if I don't know anything better, not going haywire and doing something strange. Because strange things have a way of slipping through the cracks and arriving at the store and uh, yielding huge orders that people at the store are not happy about. And who are they going to blame? The forecaster and the forecasting system. Nobody wants that because then they resort to running their own forecasts and rolling their own things. And that's uh, usually not something that is sustainable and that can scale across everything. Sometimes forecasters get hit with interesting situations like pandemics. And here's a picture of my very own supermarket that I, uh, where I went to buy toilet paper. You see how successful I was. It was the entire shelf was completely empty and it was that way for two weeks. That was the COVID pandemic when everybody in Central Europe started uh, buying toilet paper like the world's going to end. I don't know what we're going to do with toilet paper when the world's going to end, but that, yeah. Uh, I think, I still believe that was not so much an issue of supply chains, of the toilet paper supply chains. I still believe it's much more an issue of amplification of fears through social media. So there is a question for the retailer or for anybody who's doing forecasting, how do I deal with social media and possibly people in an echo chamber uh, blowing out, up fears out of all proportion, you could say, but well, it, you do see that it does have real world impacts if something like that happens. 
Something similar oops, also happened uh, recently or more recently in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, when, at least in Germany, people started fearing about the wheat and the rapeseed or, or sunflower oil uh, supply chain and people started buying wheat, like there was going to be you no know, tomorrow or sunflower oil and we again had empty shelves. And for a forecaster, there is a twofold challenge here. The first one is uh, when the problem starts, you need to forecast that we're going to have huge demand and we need to push as much into the stores as possible and we may need to have some hard decisions about, we don't have enough product to deal with the anticipated demand. How do we spread out the product? How do we allocate what we have? And then later on, after we've had these empty shelves, we have a lot of flatline zero sales, and we need to be able to, to extract, to take these zero sales and the huge sales before out of the time series. We don't want to learn from those because those are one-off events, hopefully, that are not going to be repeated next year in this way. So we don't want a seasonal forecasting method to believe that next year at the same point in the end, we'll have huge, huge demands and then a flatline zero demand. So we need to cleanse the data and that's the forecaster's job. There are different forecasting methods, which uh, we'll be talking about in this lecture series uh, further on. Um, I'm not going to go into deep details here. There is autoregressive integrated moving average, which sounds very sophisticated and is surprisingly uh, bad at forecasting, but everybody learns about it because it's in Wikipedia. There is exponential smoothing, which is better. There's regression-based approaches like classical linear, there's mixed regression, Poisson regression, Bayesian methods, machine learning like neural networks or deep learning or boosting or random forests, which I like best because they have such pretty pictures. Um, some of these have issues in retail. So uh, ARIMA is one of the first methods that you learn in forecasting. I'm not going to go into what ARIMA is or what it does. The key thing here is that yes, it can deal with causal effects like our prices, our promotions and all of these, but it, uh, it's, it's not easy and selecting a model is not trivial. Missing data is a huge problem. So if you have to cut some part of your time series out because uh, you didn't have product and you can't learn from the zero sales that you had there, uh, that's a problem for ARIMA. Uh, multiple seasonalities are hard. So this interplay between yearly seasonality and day of week seasonality, very hard for ARIMA. Um, exponential smoothing is, uh, has a hard time in dealing with causal effects. It's really not built for that. You can do that, you can train it to do that, but that's a bit unnatural. And at some point in time, you're, you're actually doing regression. And again, uh, missing data can be handled, it's hard. Uh, no, real, no really natural way to deal with metric causals like prices, temperatures, stuff like that. Machine learning uh, has become more and more prevalent in recent years uh, and it won the recent M5 retail forecasting competition with Walmart data, so it's not something to be dismissed. Um, the problem here is it's still black boxes and it's always going to be black boxes. You don't understand what's happening under the hood. And yes, I know there is stuff like explainable AI out there. Um, that is a, a step forward. It's still not going to explain everything to you what's happening here. It always, and it's, the problem is that users want to understand why the forecasts are the way they are, to build trust. And that's hard if you have a boosting method or something similar. They also have much higher resource requirements. So resources in terms of electricity, quite simply fitting a deep neural network is going to consume humongous amount of electricity if you have a large problem like a retailer does but also uh, resource requirements in terms of data scientists that actually know how to train these methods. Because this is not something that your run-of-the-mill business analysts can do. You really need somebody with a deep understanding of your neural networks or whatever they're dealing with, and those people don't come cheap. All right, to conclude, um, bad forecasts and stockouts that result from those forecasts can break your business. And in the longer version of this talk, I have a couple of very enlightening and disconcerting pictures about uh, stockouts and uh, from a retailer that went out of business because there was nothing there. People simply didn't come, customers stayed away. Correctly modeling, promo correctly modeling promotions is usually the most important part in retail forecasting. If you have a promotionally driven method or a, a business, if you're a Walmart who essentially don't do, don't do promotions, 
That makes life easier for the forecasting team because they don't have to deal with promotions. But most retailers are running promotions and correctly forecasting those is most important because they're hard to forecast and they're very visible. Your customers know about your promotions and they will not take it kindly if you have a promotion, you lure them to the store and they don't find what they're looking for. So you need to really do a good job at forecasting promotions. Out of socks are important also important and the hard part here is that you typically have something called inventory record inaccuracy. So usually your stock information at a retailer will be less accurate than you'd like it to be. When you have fashion or consumer electronics, life cycles are most important and especially the markdowns at the end of the life cycle. You really want to deal with the markdowns in a good way. On the channel data, which we haven't touched upon here, which is stuff like uh, web store information and leveraging that for better forecasts in the brick and mortar channel or vice versa, or people looking at stuff on the, in the store and then buying it online or all kinds of things, are com all kinds of combinations here are hugely promising, but really quite different to brick and mortar. I didn't deal with that yet. And uh, heteroscedicity for stock control is again very important. Once you want to look at safety amounts, once you're doing replenishment, you really have to deal with the fact that, not only, that you need, don't only need to forecast average sales, but also the high quantiles, and that can be actually important. And explainability, finally, is usually very important to build trust and to maintain trust. That is something to keep in mind. Thank you very much. <music>